Hi, I'm Ross, and today we're going to talk about suffering. No Easy Day is the title of an autobiography by Mark Owen. <clears throat> he was a Navy SEAL on the Bin Laden raid. Navy SEAL training is awe-inspiring for the SEAL's ability to endure suffering for the mission. The title, No Easy Day, challenges our expectations of mostly easy days. I raised my boys on a steady diet of adventure stuff. We read Endurance, which spoke of the Shackleton expedition. We read Contiki, where Thor Heyerdahl crossed the Pacific on a balsa raft. We read through The Gates of Splendor, which is the story of Jim Elliot killed in the Ecuadorian jungle. <clears throat> and we led, read the Little House series, which contained many accounts of hopeful suffering. In fact, my bookshelf is stuffed with books of people usually Christians, that endured suffering and had a testimony written by them or others. One such book is Created for Commitment, written by Audrey Johnson, the founder of BSF. She served in the China Inland Mission and was imprisoned by the Japanese in World War II. While I cultivated an admiration for these folks who have triumphantly endured suffering in my own life, I'm surprised by suffering. I don't welcome it. I don't expect good from it. And worse, I shirk God's invitation to join him in his work in an attempt to avoid suffering. In fact, I suppose that most of my praying is for the removal of suffering with little or no expectation of what God promised through suffering. And God has promised good through suffering in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. <clears throat> but before you and I are ready to hear this counterintuitive promise, we might need some help getting God's perspective on this. So let's pray. God in heaven, soften our hearts to see your true nature. Though we are tempted to let suffering harden our heart, cause us to deeply trust even as we suffer and suffer with others. Keep alive in us your hope in the midst of disappointment and pain. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> I'd like to talk briefly about where did suffering come from? Then I'd like to talk about purposeful suffering. And we're going to talk examples. And then I want to see the hope God promises when we persevere. In our four weeks in Isaiah, we heard of the severe suffering that was to come to Judah, leading to their exile in Babylon. And then we heard comfort, comfort my people in chapter 40. A theme in Isaiah 41, 8 is Israel, my servant. Now, Judah was an unfaithful servant whose sin resulted in suffering. And then we hear about a suffering servant in Isaiah 53, who is a servant who was faithful through suffering. Jesus didn't suffer, so we didn't have to. He suffered and invites us to join him. Jesus suffered for the joy set before him. We want to ponder this, and God willing, we may be led to wonder at God's goodness through the suffering that we would never choose for ourselves. Here's a question. Who's to blame for suffering? <clears throat> well, suffering came at the fall. It, it was man's sin that got us on this path. A better path was commanded, but our representative, Adam, chose rebellion. Now, I'm okay with Adam choosing for me because I chose the same rebellion a million times since birth. Sin's curse comes bundled with suffering. Genesis 3 speaks of misery's origin. It's human rebellion. Eve gets pain in childbirth. The earth grows thorns. Adam does hard labor until death. There's pain in birth, pain in death, and pain along the way. Pain just comes with living here on earth. Now, people might call it natural, as it is in the nature of things. And it's natural to the extent that it's the nature of the only world we have ever experienced. I doubt Adam and Eve would call it natural. To them, Having experienced both realities, 
before the fall and after, they might call it unnatural, as do I. Never did I hate death so much as when my dad died unexpectedly. Then my innate sense of the eternal was offended, and no one could tell me death was natural in the sense that it was the intended order. If you hate death and grieve at suffering, good. Good if it makes you long for God's promised restoration. For if we just hobble along at a low-grade discomfort, and instead of experiencing sharp pangs of pain, we might never long for the best. And you don't want to miss God's best. Sometimes I think that I'd like to settle for God's sort of okay, but he's not having that. God needs to do a complete makeover, far beyond my comfort level, with just a few of my hoped-for improvements. I thought we were forgiven. Well, then why do we still need to suffer? Easy answer. Suffering is not punishment for sin. Eternal death is the wage of sin. Suffering on earth is a consequence of our sin, others' sin, or sin's curse on the earth. And it'll all be set right when Jesus comes again. So why do good people suffer? Again, easy answer. Only one is good, and he chose to suffer. But we have already established that people suffer for their sin, others' sin, and nature's curse. Thus, all suffer, but not equally. So why doesn't God eliminate suffering? Now, I'm not going to ask God that question. And why? Because he's already told me that he would bring blessing via suffering. The eternal good God has planned for has planned for me, has a plan for me that far outweighs my momentary troubles. So aren't I like a petulant child to insist that God deliver me from the blessing in the way that I prefer? Excuse me, I didn't say that right. So, aren't I like a petulant child to insist that God deliver to me that blessing in the way that I prefer? <clears throat> okay, I get all that, but I got a question that I'm too ashamed to ask, but enters my thought space. Here's my unholy thought. Is it possible that God might have me experience a little more suffering than necessary? Asking this question impugns God's goodness and wisdom, but mainly it's the pot trying to advise the potter. I've seen how this line of questioning goes. Didn't go well for Job, a man far more righteous than I'll ever be. Job 40 reads like this. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Brothers, I get it that we don't like suffering. God has given you permission to ask for relief, but you need to trust him if he chooses to allow the suffering. Otherwise, we may discredit God's justice. It was Job that asked, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. We started out this section asking, who's to blame for suffering? In my defective thinking, I surmise, oh, I see. God's telling me that I made my bed and now I can lie in it. But then I see Jesus suffering with what pressed into his brow? The very thorns that cursed the earth. I made my bed, but it is he that's lying in it. Can you imagine how this must have hurt the father? Jesus, in this life on earth, showed his trust in his father, in his willingness to suffer. And let's make that our principle. Jesus proved his trust in his father by his willingness to suffer. Jesus proved trust in his father by his willingness to suffer. Here's a puzzling verse, Hebrews 5, 8. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Who here thinks they could stand to learn some obedience? Well, I think we know what those lessons involve. Maybe you want to pray like this. God, I do believe, I trust you, even in the pain. 
help me with my unbelief. Now, now that we know who's to blame for suffering, now that we have in mind God's intention to bless us, and we've been warned off on suggesting alternate approaches to the Almighty God, let's think about what good God might bring from the suffering. But before we tread this ground of thinking about God's possible purposes, remember that even if we were unable to imagine any good, God would still be good. If you're in the middle of suffering and all this talk of the good, all this talk of this good can come, to that can sound pretty hard to you. That can sound pretty almost unfeeling. Uh, but God isn't asking you to say, hey, this is awesome. I'm so happy. He knows your hardship and he will remain close. Now, I have a number of examples how good comes from suffering. They're simply in the order in which they came to mind. And here goes the first. Suffering has a way of collapsing self-reliance and readies us to believe that God has a better way. I recall an incident when I was dejected at a college age breakup. My sister Barb started listing, listing off the things that could reasonably happen if that breakup didn't occur. Somehow, in seeing all the ways that my preferred outcome could go off the rails, I became ready to trust that a God-appointed relationship was far preferred to my attempts for relational bliss. But look, I get it that every disappointment isn't going to be assuaged by that approach. What was right about that approach is that it produced less confidence in myself excuse me, and eventually ended up in me praying for the wife that God arranged for me. Our default is self-reliance, not God-reliance. Now, that'd be fine if we were actually self-reliant, but we are equally needy when enjoying success or dismay. Trouble may bring us to the end of ourselves and cause us to see the truth. We are reliant on God for everything. In what matter might you have a declaration of dependence on God as you pour out your concern to him in prayer? A second thing that suffering might do for us is it co could cause us to cry out for God. Suffering may prompt us to seek God, and in seeking God in prayer, often that would let us see God's deliverance. Foxhole desperation? Maybe. But at least you went to the right place for help. That's a positive thing. Besides, God commands us to ask. The prodigal son came to his dad with a half-baked, earn-his-way-back plan and was confronted with a love that somehow he was blind to before. Ecclesiastes 7.3 is one of those verses that takes some time to absorb. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness the heart is made glad. For by the sadness of the face the heart is made glad. Sorrow better than laughter? Look where it ends up. Look where that verse ends up. A glad heart. You already knew that God was in the business of heart change. His sort of change readies us for a glad heart. We tend to think, wow, being welcomed back by the Father is so much better than being in the pig pen. This verse is saying that the melted heart resulted from being, resulting from being welcomed back by the Father is better than when I had money and I was laughing it up. Now, the suffering is treasured because it brought him, it brought that prodigal son to notice and value his father's love. He escaped from the laughter and good times to what he was made for, to living to please his father. A third aspect that I'd like to mention is having a tested faith. I was never interested in the testing of my faith because it sounded like purposeless pain. But John Wemple, a fellow engineer, got through to me. 
here's how engineering goes for me. I'm given a problem and I engineer a solution. The solution is perfect. I've impressed myself. However, my skeptical buddies want to see the test results. They want to see it, how it works during the shake and bake conditions. I test it. It's flawed, which sends me back for another round and another. And here's the weird thing. In my pride and experience, I never want to test my solution. But after failure upon failure under my belt, testing is starting to look like a necessary step. And when it comes to faith, I have decided that I prefer a tested faith. Shake and bake. It's better than frying. Preferring a tested faith changed my attitude when I met difficulty or difficult persons. At best, I can recognize a hassle. When I'm at my best, I can recognize a hassle as the testing of my faith, and I can even welcome it. I'm not so godly that I can consider the rough stuff pure joy, but Jesus' brother, James, got to that point. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's say that a person was blocking your desires. How might your prayers change if you saw this as a test of your faith? Example four. Let's move from suffering as something that happens to us as suffering as a choice. I've already mentioned that suffering can result from our own sin, someone else's sin, or simply nature's curse. But there's another category where a close friend challenged me. God sets us up in relationship, friends, family, kids, spouse. The closer, the more likely it is that you can hurt each other. God wants healing there. But Ross's preferred method is to isolate with walls to limit my ability to incur more hurt. In fact, I might put Simon and Garfunkel's I Am a Rock on replay. My friend Tom told me that I had to move toward that person, not because I'm a masochist, but because that's what Jesus did for me. Jesus sought to reconcile his relationship with me. And I was pretty prickly and sure to hurt him when he got close enough to get hurt. But his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And he lives up to that name, coming close to his enemy, seeking to reconcile. He had the courage and the obedience to his father to come close and take the suffering he knew would come in seeking me out. Look, getting close to people can hurt, and it can sound like the worst advice you've ever heard, but isolating is sin. Tom suggested that as long as I keep moving toward the person, wanting to heal the relationship, that is obedience. And this may be my toughest challenge, but Jesus set an example, and he is scary serious about reconciliation. There are many verses on reconciliation. Here's one from the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother or sister or mom or dad or friend or kid or wife has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first. Go be reconciled to them. Then come offer your gift. If you can find your motivation in wanting a better relationship, Groovy. If you can do this, counting it all joy, praise God. But maybe you just got to set your face like Flint and move toward that person in obedient courage. The fifth example is brought to mind by friends I know who have to work to stay healthy enough to be even to be even to be able to function. I actually do worry about my death a little bit. My trepidation comes from the expected discomfort. If I get so much as a hangnail, I say stuff like, take me now, Lord. That's just a false piety 
recovering an unhealthy aversion to the physical to a physical or maybe psychological pain. I contrast that with my friend Steve, who was given months to live over a decade ago. He accepted all the painful cures and yucky foods that the doctors recommended. When I was last at his house, I choked down a piece of pizza with some tofu pretending to be cheese. It was unfit for human consumption. I can see why he didn't let me pay for the $50 pizza. Steve is not so much battling cancer as he's others focused as he lives to be a husband, father, grandfather, church leader, lawyer, and friend. He willingly eats bad pizza and gets bone marrow transplants because he trusts God will bring good out of the suffering. It's not about eking out a few more days of life before the inevitable end. It's about giving a little bit more before his inevitable reward. What good can Steve's suffering bring? Well, I know, because Steve befriended me. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I always thought that was verse was intended to give us the courage to die. For me, that verse is intended to give me the courage to live with challenges common to man and those specific to me. Example six is good of good out of suffering is one we're likely all to experience comfort from someone who has suffered similarly. Second Corinthians 1 3. I think that might be the most obvious way that our suffering can be turned into blessing. It goes like this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. I will burnt my arm taking off a radiator hose of a hot car. I had no pain that has ever equaled that. Since I just disabled the family car, we needed to call a neighbor to get me to the hospital, and it wasn't close. Who came? Mr. Peterson, who had a really fast car, and his wife, who had been burnt horribly as a young woman. She personally knew burns hurt intensely. And she wasn't going to miss a chance to comfort. One of my adult kids was caught in pornography and couldn't get out. It precipitated a crisis. The right men came out of nowhere to minister to him. They had been trapped and they had got out. And they testified to the escape that they experienced personally. Unless you saw another guy that got free, you would be tempted to believe that there was no way out. Those guys got free, and though they suffered, they are now uniquely qualified to minister to those seemingly trapped in sin. I've seen the same for rescued marriages. Who does God use to do the saving? Those guys, excuse me, let me start over. And who does God use to do the savings? Those who came within a hair's breadth of divorce. This may be the case for every type of suffering we handle, eventually, at least, in, that's handled in a God-honoring way. Is there a painful situation that you experience that God might use you to encourage another? Is there a difficulty that God is turning into a ministry? That seems inevitable. Let's look at how another person's suffering can bless us as our last example. <clears throat> Judy's parents are aging and things have changed quickly in their lives. They may have been tempted to think that they would enjoy the stuff they grew to enjoy right up to the end. But gone is the house on the water, the summer home, the boat, the mobility, the convertible, their memory, seeing this suffering in them has sent me right back to Psalm 90. Teach me, O Lord, to number my days so that I can gain a heart of wisdom. Thus, the suffering of others can be a blessing. For Judy, it's a chance to love her parents in an entirely different way, 
adapting to what they need now. For me, it's a warning to gain a heart of wisdom, knowing that my kids will fill up a 30-yard dumpster with the stuff that I considered worthy. I don't know what suffering means for mom and dad, but I'm grateful when in their confusion and frustration, they show the instincts of affection for each other. If dad can still shuffle over toward mom and hug her when she's crying about something, he's learned something and that puts him in great company. As Jesus learned through suffering, as puzzling as that sounds, principle is God, excuse me, the principle is Jesus was and we can be confident in the promised good through the suffering. Jesus was, and we can be confident in the promised good through suffering. Are you willing to state your confidence that God will bring good from suffering? Perhaps even in the same prayer where you ask for relief from suffering? Biblical hope is confidence that God will do what he promised. He didn't promise suffering and elimination. In fact, he promised just the opposite. Good from suffering, Jesus was confident. It became his crown. Jesus didn't suffer, so we didn't have to. He showed us what trust in God through suffering looks like. And let's make that a principle also. Jesus shows us what trust in God through suffering looks like. I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I am tempted to think that James must be superhuman to consider it all joy. He must have truly believed that Romans 8.28 promise and seen trouble as the path to a far greater blessing intended for him. Adding to that, James likely had Isaiah 25 in mind, where God describes a feast, just like we remember from the prodigal son parable. And this promise, the sovereign Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. Suffering is hard. Suffering is unavoidable. No one is exempt, and that includes Jesus. But for those that love him, suffering is purposeful, intended for our blessing. Sometimes we see suffering's purpose. Sometimes we can experience its profit. But we can always have peace. Jesus exclaims, take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Blessed Father in heaven, on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When darkness closes in, Lord, I'll still say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen.